Good morning from the North Carolina Zoo in Asheboro, North Carolina. It's so good to see you on this Zoo Adventures Wednesday. Steve's in front of the camera. And Megan's behind the camera. Good to have Megan with us today. Um, what are you doing? I haven't figured that out yet. That sounds fun. Hey, digital friends, what do you say we talk adaptations today? Take you around the park, introduce you to a few of the animals here at the zoo, and talk about their adaptations. Um, we've started here. This is an adaptation. These are eggs. That's a big egg. They're made out of marble. It's one of the statues, one of the art pieces here at the zoo. Um, Brooke and Steve and the design team, they talked about these a while back. We thought it was kind of a cool place to begin adaptations because as you well know, adaptations are those things, those characteristics, those traits that help animals survive in its own environment. So if you think about a fish, for example, gills, tails, fins, help them survive where they're found. We're going to introduce you to some different animals here and talk to you about some of their adaptations to help them survive in their habitat. Stay tuned. Ronin, taking a little relax, it looks like. So uh, there's different types of adaptations. We've seen some physical adaptations and there are some behavioral adaptations, some things that animals do. Bears rest through the winter time <laughs> <laughs> or stretch, I guess, apparently. So bears will rest in winter. They don't go through a true honest to goodness hibernation, but they will sleep during winter. That's one of the ways they're going to survive a time when their food supplies are low. Hibernation, there's lots of things that go with hibernation. There's hormonal changes, there are energetics, and by that we mean that if there's not enough food available to sustain the animal, they're going to go to sleep, they're going to rest as they can, but they're not going to truly hibernate. True hibernators, you can literally pick them up like a marmot. You can literally pick them up. They're not going to move around. But they still want to survive the winter. So they go through that period of sleep. They don't go to the bathroom. They're not going to wake up much. And that's a behavioral adaptation, something that they do to help them survive, in this case, survive a difficult winter season. I don't think Ronan appreciated the video. Mm. Think he's going to come back? He wanted to rest. Like, you want to rest some more? Yeah, yeah. Can you show them this cave? Yeah. So that cave is actually really hard to see inside of. And so if Ronan ever does go in there, yeah, you're not really going to get a good view of him. But it's for his happiness, not ours. So. <laughs> well said. Yeah, that's all about him being able to get out of the sun, take a nap, have a nice shady spot to relax in. We're going to give him a second or two to come back out, but you can't really go wrong with a waterfall. So let's, let's watch the waterfall. Hey, look, there he is. That was perfect timing. Man, we're good. <laughs> yeah. Can you zoom in on his claws? Of course I can. And then we're going to go test. And he's going in the grass where you can't see his claws. Of course. Well, what else would he do? <laughs> we're going to test our digital friends in a moment, even though Ronan's not going to come back <laughs> this way. So, we zoomed in a little bit early on. Okay. So, Well, let's go do a test for our guests. Okay. Let's check it out. Test, test, test one, two, three. Ah, get it? See, we're going to test the digital friends. We're going to get it. Put it. Get it? You get it? That, no, I guess not. I would say test ABC because that's what they're labeled. Oh. Mm. Okay. We'll test ABC then. <laughs> So, digital friends, can you nail this? Which claw belongs to which of the North American bears? You don't even need a hammer. Well, Megan, nail. I get it. Thanks. Oh. <laughs> so, A belongs to which bear, B belongs to which bear, and C belongs to which bear. So, 
digital friends, you can see them. I'm going to ask you which claw is the mm -mm -mm, brown bear? Which claw belongs to the brown bear? A, B, or C? You can't see the letters? A, B, C. We'll give you a moment or two to ponder which is which. Looking for the brown bear, also known as a grizzly. Color is really making a difference there. Grizzlies have the big, large hump on their back from digging a lot. Brown bear. A, B, or C. Which one is the brown bear's claw? <laughs> I figured it out. You used the key, though. I did not. You didn't? I used the hammer. Uh, you and the hammer. <laughs> Grizzly bear. Nice to get a job, Megan. Brown bear. They do a lot of fishing. They do a lot of looking for small bugs and things under rocks. They're manipulating the soil, logs. This one, yeah. black bear. So Ursus americanus. How's that for a science word? Really it big. is very small, right? Yeah. The bear is the smallest of the three North American bears. The, the black bear is? Mm -hmm. Wow. But it's a multi-tool. They can use it to shred and tear things apart. They can use it to climb. They can use it to help them dig. It does this look pretty pointy. It's a little bit of everything. Yeah. And then last but not least, C is the polar bear. That's a really Thick right, it's very thick. And if um, you're old enough to remember studs on a tire or chain, change but chains on a tire, that's what this is all about. Traction in the snow and ice. Being able to dig through there and dig a den if needed. Being able to hold down a prey item, not kill it per se, with the other sharp claws of the brown and the black bear, but this is more to pin it down. So if they're grabbing a seal, for example, holding it, so that their powerful, powerful jaws um, can do the work. Kind of like cleats um, on sports shoes, right? 100%, yeah, yeah, it's a very good analogy, as a matter of fact. So if you come back out, Megan, real quick, mm -hmm. let's go over them with everybody one more time, because that's what we do to make sure we ensure success. This is the brown bear, or the grizzly bear, the black bear, and the polar bear. I have no idea if you can hear that. There's no way you hear that. That. That's all 30 Red That's a vehicle. That sounds like almost all 30 Red Wolves. So if you're able to hear that, pretty cool. Make sure the vehicles go by again. Not part of today's presentation, not adaptation, although it's communication. They are right through those woods. They're being so loud. So I guess it is Holy kind of an adaptation smokes. if you can hear it. And this is early afternoon. Yeah. That was crazy. Bonus adaptation. Whoop. I think he just ducked away from me, Megan. <laughs> nope. Peeking back up to the surface. Who is this? I'm going to take a little breath. This is Max. He's an alligator snapping turtle. You can just see him almost like he's smiling at you, but he's not really smiling. Alligator snapping. So this is all about adaptations of animals. So Max has a few really cool ones. Again, this is an alligator snapping turtle, really big and really old fella. Gonna come up, maybe take a breath for us, or not. And that's what they're so good at. They're so good at staying submerged for minutes and minutes on end. I mean, you don't, it, Max can stay underwater for 45 minutes, not a problem. He would not need to take a breath if he wouldn't need to. He kind of chooses to take that breath if he has to. And if you've got good eyes, you might be able to see the color of Max. That's one of his huge adaptations. Now, Max, this animal, 
is a little bit more leucistic. Has a little bit more white color on him than normal. But you might be able to see he is covered in algae. That's a huge benefit if you're living in the swamps, if you're living in the streams and lakes and creeks. And you can stay submerged for so long. That algae grows on your back. You suddenly become a log. You become a rock. And animals like small fish don't see you at all. This is the epitome of an ambush predator. What a great shot, Megan. Thank you. He just sits and he waits for prey to come up close. And as soon as the prey comes close, that's when he uses another one of his amazing adaptations. He actually fishes for his meal. All right, so he doesn't use a hook and line, but he's fishing by using a lure. Check this out. This is a skull of an alligator snapping turtle. Little tiny eyes, little beady eyes checking you out. And that's the mouth, right? Yeah. That's where they get that name. Yeah. Snapping turtle. But alligator snapping turtle, really cool adaptation. When they're hunting for fish, open the mouth, and they use their tongue as a lure. That's my finger. <laughs> they use a tongue as a lure. And when the fish comes in and touches the side of his mouth or he knows that it's there, slams that mouth shut using that wonderful adaptation of the lure. So the alligator snapping turtle with several different types of adaptations. Stay still. Don't need to breathe much. Wonderful camouflage. And fishing with a lure. Adaptations. The alligator snapping turtle. Let's see if we can show you his color one more time. Red River hogs rooting around. A magnificent nose, a good sniffer, and it's got a little bone in it too, so they're able to move the dirt. And you see our female Red River hog there moving that dirt, mushing that dirt around a little bit, looking for things. Also helps with enrichment, so the keepers might have buried some stuff in there, or it could be natural. You never can tell. They're omnivores, digital friends, omnivores eating. Mm -mm 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 See, every time you ask this, I really want to say omnis. Om nom nomivores eat everything, both plant material and animal material. Can you show them the ear tuft? Yeah. Can you zoom in on that ear tuft a little bit? Zoom, zoom, zoom. That's it. That's all That's it. Look at that ear tuft. You can see like both either either Red River Hog, as a matter of fact, have those magnificent ear tufts. Get this, digital friends. They can hear grubs and bugs under the ground. Right? And having those little tufts helps kind of push more sound into the ears, kind of funnel even more sound into the ears, kind of like the tiny ears that you might have seen on owls funneling sound into the ear. So having those little tufts of hair on the ends of those ears, exact same adaptation on the Red River Hog. See the one still rooting around a little bit. Who knows what he's looking for? I wish I could tell you. I don't know if there's bugs or grubs in there. Maybe there's some um, uh, acorns. Maybe the keeper's buried some food. I really don't know. I will say it. It's got to keep the keepers very um, busy trying to figure out what exactly these animals have consumed or eaten. Yep. Um, because who knows what kind of bugs or what whatever's there? getting in there. And they're just <laughs> saying, oh, snack time. Great point, Megan. That is for sure. And I don't, can you all see the little tusks? They have tiny we little tusks. on the second one. On the second one. Yep. So they're not warthogs. Make sure we say that. They are not warthogs. This is a red river hog, but they do have those a little, those small, small reduced tusks um, on them. But adaptations for the red river hog, that snout being able to smell and root around a little bone in there helps them move the dirt. I just like, thank you very much to move the dirt like that. And then that <laughs> magnificent hearing uh, to be able to hear um, animals moving under the ground. Red river hogs. Yes. 
Here he is, Megan. There. Right here he is. Megan, see, see him. Right there. Here he is. Did you get him? Yeah. All right. No. Where'd he go? Uh, behind the rock. So we're at Seabird looking. Oh, there he is. Okay. Right Fly. Look. There. Fly. Pop. Oh. Aww. Love it. That was so cool. So talking about adaptations with animals at the North Carolina Zoo today. So one of the things we're going to talk about in the seabird habitat. Oh, here, Megan. Look over here. Over here. Oh, oh, I saw Underneath. Underneath. Now where'd you go? Come on. Cooperate. Oh, he's over there. He's over there. He's over there. He's so fast. Megan, he's over there. Megan. Wait, I think Megan. he's coming back to your side. Megan, where'd he go? Oh, uh, I don't have. I don't have puffin. We vision. need our. Here we go. Ah, puffin vision. Puffin vision. Puffin, vision. puffin. We need you to come so people can see how you f fly through the air and then you come up the surface. That didn't help us at all. <laughs> nope. But that's okay. We still like you, puffin. Don't know which puffin you are. So one of the major adaptations that puffins have is when they're swimming, they actually fly through the water. That's cool. So we're really trying to hope to see. Now we can't ever plan on that. Oh, 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 here we go. There we go. Look at those wing beats. There you go. Nice shot, Megan. So look like Sarah might be trying to help us out a little bit. <laughs> Keeper Sarah is in there working hard with her, with her birds. So yeah, when they're actually under the water, they're flying through the water. It's the same wing beats. Like right this, he's going right here. Look at that wing beat. Same exact wing beat as you would see with a bird flying through the air. I think it's kind of fun to be able to share. And look at him use the beak to catch the food, to hold on to the food. What a great shot. Are you getting that? I am. I nice. just hope it's, I hope it's kind of clear. Well, that's all we can hope for. Well, Come back to the surface and watch him munch, munch, munch. Wow. <laughs> so he's holding on to all those fish. And he's able to hold them crosswise in his beak. They say they can catch some really small fish. They can hold 30 to 40 fish in that beak. Now, these fish are a little bit bigger that um, Keeper Sarah was throwing out there. But they still hold, they'll grab the, feet, grab the food, hold it crosswise in their beak. And then now they can take it back to the nest. They can take it back to their uh, mate and be able to share the fish at that time. Oh, wow. Another thing that's going on, oh, he's over there now. I think this one's just going around collecting. The I fish. think he is too. <laughs> it's like my fish today. Nobody else is swimming. Nobody else is diving. My fish. Oh, hello. How you doing? <laughs> so what a fun little demonstration there that this um, uh, horned puffin, that's what we have at the zoo, horned puffin was sharing with us today. So other adaptations. Uh, Megan, can you do me a favor? Can you show them the holes in the wall? Yeah. Like you mean the ones right here at the bottom, right? Let me see. Like, yeah, exactly. You know what that is? Um, a hole in the wall? You are, Megan, what do you think the hole might represent in the wall? Um, a hidey place. A hidey place. Good deal. I like that. What, believe it or not, it's a nest site. What? Right? So they actually nest, they're cavity nesters. So they actually nest in holes, in cavities, in the cliff side. So this actually represents what it would truly look like wow. in a puffin rookery. Rookery, a group of Group of nesting animals. That's a cool a word. Isn't that, that's kind of cool to share. Um, so it's kind of fun to think. You can see one that Megan's on there. I can see a couple with my eyes. Wait. What you got? Steve, there's there's some like up high. You see some up high? How did how do they get there? Right. So puffins. Oh, you can look way over. Can you see off the right, Megan? Oh my goodness, a little bit dark. A little bit. A little bit misty. Oh, there's yeah. a better shot. Oh, yes. So they can walk. They can hop up those cliff sides, walk up those cliff sides, and they can fly just fine. So if they're out hunting, out looking for fish um, in the uh, north or where they live, they can fly around and look for food, but they can hop up and down these cliff faces as well. And I see a really cool enrichment item in there. I didn't see it until just now. What is it? Can you see the mirror? The Mirror. Where? Oh my gosh! Right. That's oh, I totally did not that realize cool? that was a mirror. Right. So I'm sure that is an enrichment item, and I see a lot of other enrichment items in there too. But but oh no, oh, yep. come back. What, what are we talking about today? Adaptation. Yeah. So they can fly just fine. Yeah. They can hop around um, to get around the space as they need. We saw them flying underwater. Yeah. The same type of wing beats. We saw them using their bill to carry the fish. Mm -hmm. Not a problem. And here's an example of what a replica bill from a horned puffin. Whoa. You can see that. Yeah, there's no light. Hold on, I got this. Oh, there we go. So that Whoa. is replica bill. And this, for the male, there's actually a sheath over top of that that will grow and get very colorful. Um, to attract the mates. 
So it's kind of neat. So horned puffins at the North Carolina Zoo, some really cool adaptations of these birds. So, different types of adaptations that we've talked about, physical, behavioral, and then there's the wapti and the bison. One really cool adaptation these animals have is something you may not think about with mammals very often. What about migration? Yep. These animals migrate. And you can see the two, the bison and the elk that are down here, bison and the wapiti. Wapiti, again, the Native American word for American elk. I'm trying to use wapiti more often now. A lot of antlerless wapiti out there. Antlers, another type of adaptation. We've talked about antlers and horns in the past. You can really see what's going on with Tommy's antlers there. They're growing, covered in that velvet, that kind of almost fleshy material. And it is, it's, it's hair, it's furred. That's a whole other level of adaptation. We're talking about migration in the bison and the wapiti. And they do, they migrate seasonally, just like your songbirds do, just like some of your other birds do. They migrate seasonally to look for food. Same thing, exact same thing in the wapiti and the bison. People are more familiar with the bison migration but both of them will. And a really unique thing about that migration, of course, happens in the winter, kind of back and forth, looking for food. But as they migrate, something really cool happens. One, they're eating food constantly. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, Steve, so what? Well, that means they're pooping food out constantly. Yeah, okay, Steve, that, that makes sense too. And as they walk, though, they're becoming farmers. They're churning up the soil. They're grinding in those seeds and planting those prairie gla grasses as they're going around. And they are eating the trees before they get tall, maintaining that beautiful prairie-like look. So they're kind of taking care of their own ecosystems by migrating seasonally, eating the grasses, pooping them out, and then churning up the soil and essentially planting those grasses as they go. But the adaptation here, again, migration in a mammal, bison and wapiti. Holy cow, look at that bee! That's usually our very first reaction, isn't it? Yeah. When we see a bee. Yep. We get a little nervous. We don't be stung. And I get it. If I saw a bee that big, though, I probably would be, um... How, how big is it? Let me show you. Yeah. That's a pretty good size bee. Yeah. <laughs> but, so one of their adaptations, of course, is that powerful sting. Um, but the unique thing on the honeybee, now not all bees, the honeybee's stinger is barbed at the end. It's barbed at the end. So when it goes in, it can't come out. It can't just slide back, back out. It can't be stung Ow. over and over, right? So unfortunately, if they sting you, they die. Check this out, Aww. right? Check out this graphic. I'll kind of share some of these with you when we get a chance. Avoid the sting. Absolutely. So here's some ways you can avoid being stung. But look at the first line. I do not want to sting you. I would just die if I did. Aww. And that's true. If they do sting you, unfortunately, that stinger stays in and they can die. Because when they try to get away... And some of that stays behind, and that venom sac stays behind. And that's that's what that's one of the things that makes them them. Right, exactly. Well said, yeah. Megan. So they don't want to sting you, but 
Look what Megan can show you. These are some ways that you can avoid being stung. Don't swat. I know it's hard sometimes. That makes sense. I, um, if, if, if somebody swats at me, I swat back. 100%. Wear shoes when oh, walking in a field. That's a hard one. I love going barefoot. My wife loves going barefoot too. And it's always wear shoes when you're out there. Especially if you're walking through a field of flowers like clover mm. or dandelions. Three, avoid the hive. Now, a lot of times when bees are swarming, they're not in sting mode. They're looking for a place to create a new hive. But if you come across a hive, that's what they're protecting. So avoid those hives when you can. And one more or a couple other really nice things to be able to do. Clothing. Wear light clothing to avoid the sting of a honeybee. Dark clothing is threatening. Dark clothing is danger to some of those animals. So if you're in that dark clothing, they might, they might perceive that as being dangerous. And then one that might make sense, your perfumes and your body sprays, don't wear the flowery stuff because it's an attractant by definition, right? Yeah. It's going to smell good and animals may be attracted to it, especially like the honeybees. So the adaptation for the bee, that stinger, that protective mechanism can also be a detriment to them because if they do sting you, when they pull out, that venom sac is left behind. That means part of the bee is left behind and they will die if they sting you. Let's try to work on avoiding being stung. Wear the shoes, especially around flowers. Wear light colored clothing. Uh, try not to swat at the bees. Um, don't wear the perfumey, the flowery perfumey um, perfumes. Uh, and if you find a hive, try to avoid it the best you can. And you avoid the sting. Animal adaptations, those traits, those characteristics, those things that they have or do that help them survive in their space. I'm in Kid Zone. We have a really cool wildlife pond here. So when you're out and about, you can find places like this. Come check this out. And if you take your time and you observe, maybe you'll find salamander eggs in a pond that you come across. Maybe tadpoles in your favorite pond. A frog. Maybe you'll saw, see a bird come down to take a drink. Maybe you'll even find a bird or an animal taking a bath. But if you take your time and look around you can notice animal adaptations, those things that help them survive in their, in their own habitat. So your Zoo Adventures team today, Steve was in front of the camera. And Megan filming. We are always so glad that you tuned in to be with us Wednesday morning. Stay safe, y'all. We'll see you again soon. Bye now.